I have, um, I think I've told you before, I have children, and those children have ungratefully grown up and left me. Um, they'll go to no lengths to get far, far away from me. My daughter is currently on an airplane flying from uh, Germany, where she landed at four this morning, to Thailand, where she intends to spend 30 days backpacking alone. And so uh, she has agreed to carry a little tracker, which her brother has, not her mother. <laughs> but um, <laughs> so funny. I'm sure that will work its way into some talk somewhere. <laughs> Maybe into my therapist. <laughs> but, you know, when your kids leave you, this is why God gives you grandchildren. So you don't feel quite as rejected because they never want to leave you. Um, I have the joy of being in a new season of life where I have three granddaughters and a fourth granddaughter on the way. And so I have two and a half, uh, two, two twin girls who are four months old. Not quite old enough for me to play with yet, but that's okay. We're practicing on the two and a half year old who'll be getting a new baby sister in uh, April. But I just love being a grandmother. Uh, I had to work hard to come up with my grandma name. That's, that's a big, that's a thing. If you didn't know that, if you're too young to know that, it's very stressful. They're gonna call you this for the rest of your life. I could never decide on one, and so I'm just Kimmy. Um, because I couldn't come up with a name. But when that little voice says your name, Kimmy, play with me, Kimmy, watch me, Kimmy, carry me. Oh, your just heart melts. I don't even want to see my children anymore. <laughs> One of the things I love doing with my granddaughter is reading books with her. And for Christmas, because not only do I want to read to her, I so want her more than anything else in this world, I want her to know how precious she is to God. I want her to know that he's got a great big story, and she's part of his story, a really precious part. And so one of the things that I gave her for Christmas was a collection of books that are stories from the Bible that begin to tell her his story. Uh, it's in a little set, and so you slide the books in there, and there's maybe 10 books. And my idea was we would start with book one, Adam and Eve, and then we'd work our <laughs> way through so she could get used to the stories. Her idea is, Whatever book has lions in it, that's the book she wants to read. And she wants to read it over and over again. Overall, what I want her to understand is these aren't just separate stories. This is one big story. And that can be hard to do, particularly if you were raised in Sunday school. Maybe you've got that feeling. And you know this story and you know that story. And when you hear the stories, in a sense, they're, they're kind of separate stories, right? I mean, they have different characters. They have uh, different timelines, different situations. And yet, the reality is, they are just one big story. The story of the Bible is one story that God is writing, that he has authored, and that he's still writing even today. And so as we think about stepping into this study where we're looking at the book of Nehemiah, um, it's sort of like the books have, have gotten out of order. If you look at the 66 books of the Bible... There's 66 different books that have been squished all together and put into one volume. You find the book that we're going to study, Nehemiah, sort of in the middle of the Old Testament, right before Psalms. Well, here's the problem. It's like when she takes Daniel in the lion's den and she puts it before Adam and Eve. That book is out of order. That book actually belongs at the end of the Old Testament. We're going to be looking at the story of the very last episodes of the life of Israel before Jesus comes. It's the last record of the Old Testament time that we're going to be looking at. So when you look at it in the Bible and it's way up here, I want you to think about reorganizing it. So we're going to be looking at that in history. But you have a timeline. I want you to look at this timeline real quick. Just as a reminder to us of exactly the order of the story and how things fall into place. And where we are as we consider stepping into the story of Nehemiah. The story that God writes begins for us with the creation of the world. Just as a reminder, that's not the beginning of the story for God. God has no beginning and no end. But at a point in time, God chose to create the world. Why did he do that? Because God has so much magnificence and glory and worth that is best exhibited when it can be appreciated and worshipped. At a point in time, 
God made the decision that he wanted to display all of his character qualities. He wanted to reveal them so that they could be seen and appreciated and worshipped. And so first he created the world. This wonderful testament to the creative power of God. And then he created man. And he put him in the garden so that man could see it and appreciate it and know him and give him the worship that he was due. Now you already know this story, right? They, they choose to disobey God. They get set outside of the garden. And from that point on, the whole rest of the story, even the part that we're in, is God pursuing us to bring us back into a right friendship with him again. Gosh, doesn't that make you feel special? I mean, because when I look at this list and I realize the whole history of mankind fits on one eight and a half by 11 page, I don't feel very significant anymore. (laughs) In the scheme of things, this is how it is to God. He's so big, so magnificent, so unsearchable, so immeasurable, that literally the history of mankind is like an eight and a half by 11 page. And yet, in the midst of all of that, God is pursuing you. That's amazing. You are significant. It is his story, but his story is about knowing you and you knowing him. And so part of that story, you know that he decides to start again when man gets so evil with a flood. Population builds back up. They decide to disobey God who told them to go scatter into the whole world and fill it, and they wouldn't do it. And so at the Tower of Babel, he decides to divide up their languages so they have no choice but to group together and spread out. He forces them to obey. And then out of all of those people, God decides that the way he's going to reach all of us and bless all of us is to settle his favor on one man who will be the head of one family that he will help create, who will then be the instrument through which he brings the Messiah. One story over and over, that man's name was Abram. Abram has a son named Isaac. Isaac has two sons named Jacob and Esau. He chooses one over the other. Jacob has 12 sons. Those 12 sons become the nation of Israel. And he says, Israel is going to be my people. Those who bless Israel will be blessed. Those who curse Israel will be cursed. And through you, Israel, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. That's why We study their story. Because God is bringing blessing to you and to me and to all of mankind through this family. That's why their story is important to us. If only they realized the significance. And yet time and time again, this family, this nation that God said, be faithful to me because the world is going to be blessed through you, continue to disobey. He created a nation for them. He gave a special land to them in Canaan. He allowed them to have kings even though... He said he wanted to be their king. They said, oh, we want to be like everybody else. So he allows them to have kings. Eventually, out of disobedience, those 12 tribes that made up one nation, they can't even stay together. Now, maybe you can relate to this. Have y'all ever had a family feud? (laughs) They have a big family feud. They have separate kingdoms get set up. And they still can't obey God. And out of punishment, God chooses to allow other nations to come in and conquer them as discipline. And that's where we pick up our story. They, all of Israel has been hauled away into exile as punishment from God. But he made this promise through one of his prophets, Jeremiah. He said, in 70 years, I'm going to bring you back into the land and we're going to start this process again. <laughs> and he gave him all these wonderful promises. And that's where we pick up our study from last time. If you'll remember Ezra. King came into power as God said he would and said you can go back into the land and you can build the temple. So rather than go through that with you, I thought this would be fun. There's a ministry called the Gospel Project. I love giving you guys tips and ideas on how to study the Bible. Last semester I gave you some resources, some online study tools. Well, if you've never looked at the Bible Project videos, they have one less than 10 minute video for every book of the Bible. So it quickly helps you understand what the content is and how it fits into the big story. So we're actually going to watch together the Bible Project video. It's eight minutes, and then you're going to go to group of Ezra and Nehemiah. It's going to pick up where I just left off of the people going back into the line. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah 
In most modern Bibles, these books are separate, but that division happened long after it was written. It was originally a unified work written by a single author. The story is set after the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem and its temple and took many of the people into exile. And this book picks up about 50 years later and tells the return of some Israelites to Jerusalem and then what happened when they rebuilt the city and their lives there. Specifically, the book focuses on three key leaders who led the rebuilding efforts. You have Zerubbabel, then Ezra, and then Nehemiah. And the book's design focuses on the efforts of each leader. Zerubbabel leads a large group of people back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. Then about 60 years later, Ezra arrives in Jerusalem to teach the Torah and rebuild the community. And then he's followed by Nehemiah, who leads the rebuilding of Jerusalem's walls. And these three stories are designed to be parallel. Each begins with the king of Persia prompted by God to send the leader to Jerusalem and he offers resources and support and then each leader encounters opposition in their efforts which they then overcome but in a way that leads to a strange anticlimax in each of the three parts. Let's back up and see how it fits together. So the story begins with a decree from Cyrus, the king of Persia, and he's moved by God to allow the exiles to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. And the author says this fulfills a promise made by the prophet Jeremiah that the exiles would one day return to Jerusalem. Now, this fulfillment should trigger our hopes in the many other prophetic promises that exile was not the end of the story. We have hope for a future messianic king from the line of David. We have hope for a rebuilt temple where God's presence will dwell with his people. Hope for God's kingdom to come over all the nations and bring his blessing, just like he promised Abraham. And so it's with all these hopes in mind that we read on into the story of Zerubbabel. His name means planted in Babylon. He represents the generation born in Babylonian captivity, and he leads a wave of Israelites returning to Jerusalem. After they settle there, they rebuild the altar for offering sacrifices and later the temple itself. The foundation laying ceremony and then the temple's final dedication, these are key moments. The past stories of the tabernacle and temple's dedication should be in our minds. This is when the fiery cloud of God's presence is supposed to descend. He's dwelling with his people and it doesn't happen. And so while some people are happy about this new temple, the elders who had seen the previous temple of Solomon, they cry out in grief. It is nothing like their glorious past or their hopes for the future. And it's right here that we get the first story of opposition, and it's very odd. So the grandchildren of the Israelites who were not taken into exile, they had been living in Jerusalem all along, they come to offer help with the temple rebuilding. And Zerubbabel refuses. He says, you have no part in our temple. And this, of course, generates a conflict which Zerubbabel overcomes, but it's very strange because the prophets had envisioned that the tribes of Israel would all come together along with all of the nations to participate in the worship of the God of Israel when the kingdom finally comes. So this is an anticlimactic moment to say the least. In the next section, we zoom forward about 60 years and we're introduced to Ezra. He's a leader among the exiled Israelites in Babylon. And he's a Torah scholar and a teacher. And so he gets appointed by Artaxerxes, king of Persia, to lead another wave of people back to Jerusalem. And Ezra wants to bring about spiritual and social renewal among the people. Our hopes are high. And again, we come to another anticlimactic moment in the story. Ezra learns that many of the exiled Israelites that had come back, they had married non-exiles who had been living around Jerusalem. Some of them were non-Israelites, and almost certainly some of them were. Ezra then appeals to the commands of the Torah that Israel was supposed to be holy and separate from the ancient Canaanites. And he then says that the people living around Jerusalem are like the Canaanites. They're going to corrupt the exiles. So Ezra offers a prayer of repentance, and it's very heartfelt. But then he rallies all the leaders and enacts this divorce decree that says all these marriages should be annulled, the women and children sent away. And then the decree is only partially carried out. We're given a list of some of the men who divorced their wives. The story is very strange for a number of reasons. First of all, God never commanded Ezra to do any of this. It was the leaders of Jerusalem who led Ezra to make the decree. Second, the contemporary prophet Malachi, he did say that the exiles should care about purity, but he also said that God was opposed to divorce. And so the mixed results of the decree, this all fits into this pattern of a strange concluding anticlimax. 
which leads us to the next section about Nehemiah. He's an Israelite official serving in the Persian government, and when he hears about the ruined state of Jerusalem's walls, he prays and then gets permission from the Persian king Artaxerxes to go and rebuild the walls. The king even gives them an armed escort and all these resources. So after arriving in Jerusalem, he begins the building project, and he too faces opposition from the people who had already been living around Jerusalem. Once again, we face a tension in the story. The contemporary prophet Zechariah said that the new Jerusalem of God's kingdom would be a city without walls, that God's presence would surround it, that people from all nations would come and join the covenant people. But Nehemiah seems to operate with the opposite vision. He informs the people surrounding Jerusalem that they have no part in Jerusalem. And this, of course, provokes them to hostility. And so while Nehemiah carries out his vision for the city with integrity and courage. They have to build the city with armed guards to protect them. We keep wondering, could this whole conflict have been handled differently? And this all leads to the conclusion of the book in two movements, first positive and then negative. Ezra and Nehemiah combine forces to bring about a spiritual renewal among the people. They gather all the exiles together for a festival. They read and teach the Torah to all the people for seven days. And then they celebrate the ancient Feast of Tabernacles to remember God's faithfulness from the Exodus and the wilderness journeys. Then they offer a confession of their sins. They vow themselves to renew the covenant, follow all the commands of the Torah. And they finish with a great celebration over the temple, the walls of Jerusalem, and we're thinking, this could be the turning point, but it's not. The book ends on a huge downer. Nehemiah tours around the city, and he finds that the people have not been fulfilling their covenant vows. So Zerubbabel's work is undone as he finds the temple being neglected and staffed by all these unqualified people. He then discovers that Ezra's work is being compromised. He finds everyone violating the Torah, people are working on the Sabbath, and even his own work on the walls is involved because people are setting up markets around the walls of Jerusalem and working on the Sabbath. So Nehemiah, he goes on a rampage. He's beating people up, he's pulling out their hair, and he's yelling, Obey the commands of the Torah. And his final words are a prayer that God would remember him, that at least he tried, and the book ends. I mean, it's very strange. But we've been prepared for it, right? These anticlimactic moments have been woven into the book's design intentionally. And so it raises the question, what on earth does this book contribute to the storyline of the Bible? Well, remember, the book started by raising our hopes in the prophetic promises about the Messiah, the temple, the kingdom of God, and then none of it happens. So even though Israel is now back in the land, their spiritual state seems unchanged from before the exile. And while Ezra and Nehemiah, they do their best, but their political and social reforms among the people don't address the core issues of their heart. So what the book is pointing out is the same need highlighted by the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel. What God's people need is a holistic transformation of their hearts if they're ever going to love and obey their God. And so the book ends on a downer, yes, but it forces you to keep reading on into the wisdom and prophetic books to find out what is God going to do to fulfill his great covenant promises. But for now, that's the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. What's fun for us is while the book does sort of end with wah, wah, we are going to conclude after Nehemiah with the book of Malachi who was a prophet, a contemporary of Nehemiah, who spoke to the people at the same time. And in that beautiful book, we get to see God's heart and God previewing the Messiah yet to come. It's a wonderful place for us to end instead of ending on Nehemiah. And yet they are both the last word of the Lord before a period of silence when the New Testament opens. So that is what we have to look forward to. You're going to go now in your groups and get oriented a little bit. You're going to have the opportunity to get your study book and look at it and then uh, your assignment for the week and then we will come back in here.